All right, so one of the main advantages that we talked about with SEM was the sort of 3D nature that the images have. And again, this is caused by depth of field. So let's explore depth of field in some more detail here. So um, this actually comes from what we talked about in light microscopy, uh, the depth of field equation. So same thing here as what you've seen uh, before. So, um, so we have depth of field equals two times the resolution uh, and then over tangent of the uh, convergence angle here. And again, that's the angle um, with this beam converging down to the sample out of the aperture. We also um, just talked in the last module about how the pixel size uh, controls the resolution um, because we have uh, a, a minimum pixel size of 100 microns. So we can relate the resolution and the pixel size to the magnification with this ex expression uh, that we also used in the light microscopy chapter. So basically if we plug this resolution into the depth of field equation, we get the following sort of approximation based on that pixel size. So this tells us that the depth of field is approximately 200 over the convergence angle. And again, as a refresher, this is the optical axis here and then the convergence down to the uh, probe diameter here is the convergence angle, and then uh, that's multiplied by the magnification m. So this would be in microns since this is in microns. So what this tells us, the kind of the, the conclusion of this is that a larger aperture angle will result in a lower depth of field. And we're typically striving for a higher depth of field. All right, so the uh, let's go back to this for a second. So aperture angle is obviously very important, um, but we want to sort of manipulate this equation because aperture angle isn't something that we directly uh, vary or change easily when you get into the SEM software and start using the instrument. So we want to uh, change this and rearrange the expression a little bit to account for what we can actually change. And so uh, we can't control aperture angle directly, but instead what we can do is we can affect the aperture, oops, sorry about that, we can affect the aperture opening, the radius. So this is the radius of the aperture, R fap, <laughs> that's the uh, aperture opening. So we can affect that. And we can also affect the working distance, which is the distance from the aperture to the specimen. So those two variables basically tell us what this angle, um, uh, what this angle alpha is. And so these are things that we can actually sort of, I like to think of them as knobs. We can change the aperture opening radius. We can change the working distance very easily. These are things in the software or with the control panel that you can do easily. So if we account for those two variables and we replace that, um, those two variables for alpha, we get this expression. So you'll notice that basically it's um, the working distance d sub w over r f replaces that alpha term. So from here, then if we want to increase the depth of field, then what we're going to strive to do it with our knob, so to speak, is decrease the aperture size and make the working distance uh, longer. So we're going to increase this distance here. The combination of those two will effectively decrease this alpha in the expression, giving us better depth of field, right? So we replace it because these are the things that we can control. All right, so let's look at some examples of images taken with some different settings here then. So um, these four images, A, B, C, and D, um, have decreasing aperture size and increasing working distance. So you see the different combinations. So A has a working distance of 25 millimeters and an aperture opening of 85. Then we go all the way up to um, a 48 millimeter working distance and a decrease the 
aperture opening radius to 25. So we basically go through uh, with this. So we would expect that these increases in the depth of field under these conditions would increase the depth of field and give us more of that sharp focus on different planes. Um, and so if we look at all of these images, um, is that the case? You know, look at these images. Do you, uh, do you see differences in the sort of focus in any areas? Um, I would say that these are actually pretty similar. Um, with the maybe exception of A here, they all look, you know, pretty similar. So let's, let's see if we can figure this out. So what we're going to do is, using those expressions, let's calculate or approximate the depth of field with these conditions. So I've given you these conditions. Um, let's only focus on A and D and see if you can calculate what the depth of field is for conditions A and D given in the caption here. So approximate that and then we'll see if that shines any light uh, on the situation. So uh, make those quick calculations, pause the video, and then come back. Uh, this will also be in the quiz, so fill that out, and then come back and we will discuss. All right, so hopefully you've had a chance to approximate these depths of field, and so let me show you the calculations I have. So this is our depth of field equation incorporating the uh, radius of the aperture, magnification, and the depth of field. The um, magnification was set for um, both those images at 300, and then the depth of field uh, and the, sorry, the, the working distance and the radius were defined in the caption. So if we plug in those values for A and D, we see that for A, we have a depth of field of approximately 200 microns, and then it jumps up uh, to 1280 microns, uh, or basically a millimeter, uh, for D. So let's go back to the image then. So we see here the scale bar. This is 100 microns, right, this step. And so that distance is pretty similar, actually, to the height of these uh, pillars, these little uh, features in the structure. So we have a depth of field for A, for this image, of 200, so basically double that length. And so the depth of field is already so high that we should see most features, right? Because it's basically double this distance. And so we already have such a good depth of field that increasing it to uh, 1,200 um, really doesn't give us that much, right? It only gives us an incremental change from A to D. So depth of field really isn't the only thing to worry about. Uh, in, in this particular image at least, because the features aren't that much bigger than 100 microns, right? So I just wanted you to do that calculation to kind of see um, the connection there. So we can talk about increasing depth of field, but at some point um, there, there's obviously going to be diminishing uh, returns there. All right, so we've talked a lot about this um, depth of field, and I wanna circle back for a second to accelerating voltage, because we've seen this kind of have a dueling effect. And so I want to sort of just rehash this a bit. So on one hand, uh, if we increase the accelerating voltage, this has the effect from this uh, beam size equation, oh, sorry, um, of uh, reducing the beam size from this equation that we have here, right? And so that's generally good. And so the, the actual probe or beam size of the electron beam is smaller, and so that's good for resolution. However, we also have to consider the interaction volume and how large that is because that will dictate the electrons or x-rays that are coming off of the sample and where they come from. And so here, increasing the um, accelerating voltage, as is shown here, so this is a higher voltage, has a larger volume. And so electrons can escape from a larger area uh, in this case. So the accelerating voltage has, again, this kind of dual uh, role. Reduces probe size, but also increases the interaction volume. And so we have to consider that when it comes to imaging and SEM and also uh, TEM to some extent.